Welcome to the Leader's Notebook with Dr. Mark Rutland. Dr. Rutland is a world-renowned leadership expert. He is a New York Times best-selling author, and he has served as the president of two universities. The Leader's Notebook is brought to you by Global Servants. For more information about Global Servants, please visit our website, globalservants.org. Here is your host, Dr. Mark Rutland. If you have your Bibles, if you'll take those and turn, if you will, to the book of Genesis, the third chapter. Um, just so that I have a, a little sense of who's here, those lights are so bright. If, if uh, this is your first time on a Wednesday night here at the Beaufort Church of God, would you raise your hand so I can see if we have any first timers here? So we're in the back and there's another and another. Good. We're glad that you're here and we delight in your presence. My second question is, if if this is not your Sunday morning church, but it's becoming your Wednesday night church, will you raise your hand? If you go elsewhere on Sunday night, there's my Methodist guys, and there's some others. Wonderful. Now, to those of you who have made this your Wednesday night church, but you have not yet joined here, uh, you know, you're going to get a free lunch on Sunday at a really... <laughs> At a really great restaurant, right? I say, come forward for the altar call and tell the pastor you want to join the church. <laughs> On last Wednesday night, we began this new series. I've, I've been uh, for about 16 weeks in the book of Acts. And uh, then last Wednesday night, we began this series on the book of Genesis. And I, I will carry this forward on through most of the end of the year. I think, I think through the end of the year. I have about 16 more Wednesday nights left. And uh, I think I'll just, I'm just going to take my time with the book of Genesis. I'm doing the same thing with Genesis that I do with Acts, and that is to start over. Uh, by the time you've preached for a half a century, you, it's, it's easy to just find a verse of scripture that you've preached on eight or ten times. And the book of Genesis is a treasure. So I just made my mind to wipe all that out. Start completely over. I, I hope you enjoyed the series on Acts because I, I really enjoyed starting over with the book of Acts. And I've done the same thing with Genesis. On last Wednesday night, we began by talking about the, the beauty of creation. It's perfection. It's, uh, it's wonder that, that the creation was good. God says, and and he saw that it was good, that it was very good. Of course, it's not as though he had doubts. So that's, that's not the point of that. It is to say that the, the extension of God's personality was embedded in the creation in every cell of every leaf, in, in every drop of blood, in every animal, in humanity itself, that the goodness of God, was was in the creation. Beyond that, we also saw that the the goodness of God extended to every part of it, the perfection, its providence. God was caring for the creation. Um, there are things that we think uh, are because of the curse, the fall of Adam. Tonight we're going to deal with that. But take for example... I, I, I love to preach on Labor Day. It's a, it's, I know it seems odd. It's one of my favorite Sundays of the year to preach because I love to preach on the sanctity of work. But it, you'd be surprised how many people think that work happened to us because of the fall of Adam. And that is not true. Work became harder, especially in an agrarian civilization. Work became harder because sin had infected the ground. But work was in the Garden of Eden, and God placed the man in the garden and told him to care for it and till it. So, so Adam worked in the Garden of Eden, but work was, was a blessing. It was a gift. Um, we talked about the, the gift of innocence, that they, they were the, the humanity in the Garden of Eden. They, they were pure. They, they were not, their minds were not clouded by things. We talked about the, the pure gift of sexuality, that there was certainly passion, but not lust. There was, there was the joy in each other, the intimacy. And that's what the passage means. It says, and the man and the woman were naked and were not ashamed. I said, uh, well, some of the modern translations translate that in a, it's a bit of an effete translation in my view. They translate it embarrassed. And that, that's really not a, 
very strong translation for the word. Shame is a different thing. Shame is a is a deep psycho emotional wound. Embarrassment is what you feel if you drop your spaghetti in your lap at a fancy dinner. Shame is what you feel if your mind is wounded by, say, childhood molestation or shame of your personhood. But Adam and Eve were in love. They they had passion. They were sexual beings. The the creation is sexual. Grass is sexual. Um, uh, vegeta- vegetation is sexual. Animals are sexual. God is not repulsed by sexuality. <laughs> see, he like thought it up and everything. See, it it is the corruption of it that that has that is was the result of the fall. So all of these things that the the creation of God was perfect, beautiful, wonderful. It was God said good and very good. Now, starting tonight, there was, however, what we might call a theological joker in the deck. Can I use that uh, highly secular example in a church of God? I myself do not know what a joker in the deck means, but I have backslidden Baptist friends that have explained it to me. It's almost as if I've held a deck of cards. Um... But that theological joker in the deck is free moral agency. God made them perfect, but he did not make them lacking the capacity to choose. God put the, made them perfect, made the environment perfect. It was beautiful. It was, it was without shame. It was out without corruption. It was without violence. All of those things. And they, they, they even lacked the the knowledge of evil. They didn't even grasp the the horrible concept of evil. They couldn't see that. They didn't even know what it meant. But God made them with the capacity to choose. Humanity was not captive in the Garden of Eden. They were given the Garden of Eden. They were not held in bondage. Humanity was not a moral or spiritual puppet. They were not God's toy. They were free moral agents made in the image of God. And that was the joker in the deck. Now, just in passing, I don't want to spend a lot of time with it, but the the issue then arises, God knew God is all-knowing. He is omniscient. Nothing is beyond his capacity to know it, and he does know it, and he knows it before it happens. He knows our thoughts before we think them. So God knew that Adam and Eve would choose wrongly. But at that point, we must draw a line, or we step over into the into the depressing uh, areas of hyper Calvinism. And that is that God's foreknowledge makes it foreordained. That God then as a result of that almost caused Adam to sin. Adam had the capacity not to sin. But we, we in, in the Pentecostal, charismatic and Wesleyan community, we, we do not believe that God's foreknowledge causes foreordination. That Adam, Adam sinned of his own free will, free moral agency. But God saw that. So the plan of redemption, this is very, very important. The plan of redemption is not something God thought up in, in order to deal with the fall of Adam. All of that the creation, the fall, the plan of redemption, the coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ, his millennial reign, all of that for was in God's mind before he ever said, let there be light. So it's not like when Adam fell, God didn't say, oh man, now, now what do we do? Got to come up with plan B. God never operates on plan B. But... That does not obviate the fact that Adam 
had the capacity to choose rightly, and he didn't. Now, let's talk about the fall. I want to deal with the aspects of the fall in this, but it's, it's not, this is not going to be a depressing teaching. We're going to bring it to a conclusion in a few minutes. Look at, look at chapter three. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yea, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, you shall not eat it, eat of it. Neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Which up until that moment, Remember, they had no knowledge of evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat and the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked. The introduction of shame. Shame was the first indication of the fall of humanity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather here in our numbers and reach to each other across the body of your word and believe that you reach to us in the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray that when we leave here tonight, that we will say to each other, surely the Lord, a good and loving God, has spoken unto us. In Jesus' name, amen. There are two principal lies upon which, with which Satan deceived Adam. The first is, you shall not die. I don't know how many of you were here a few Sundays ago. How long ago was it when I preached here on Sunday morning and preached on life and death? But if you haven't done, I would like to recommend that you get that message. Because the, the, the issue is, what does life mean and what does death mean? So, Satan beguiles Eve with the issue that she will not die. But God is using death to mean a different kind of death. Indeed, at one level, Satan told Eve the truth. When she ate the fruit, she didn't die. But she died. She died spiritually. Death was now introduced into the veins of humanity. We now have the capacity to die. We are, we are in spiritual death. But that's, that's how it happened. But because God is using the word die, Satan plays on it and twists it. It is one of Satan's greatest tricks to twist the vocabulary of God. He wants to torture our minds to, to hear what God says, but think of it, see it in a different way. The second is this. You shall be as gods is the second lie. The first is you shall not die, and they did, and you shall be as gods. Now, why is that a lie? Because actually, a certain level of power did come to them, which they did not have. And that was the power to see evil, to think evil. They, they had, did not have that. Remember, they were living in a pure form. They were, they were naked and there was no shame. So not just sexual evil. They, they, they couldn't really comprehend what evil meant. And now they had that capacity. You see it's in, with a small g. You shall be as gods. Indeed, in a sense, that became true. Because the gods, the gods of paganism, are not righteous. They are not good. They are not holy. The god of gods, the god of Abraham, Isaac, Israel, the god of Jesus Christ, the god who spoke light into existence and made Adam and Eve from the clay of a riverbank, that God is God, holy, righteous, omnipotent, all-powerful. So they were already, let us make man in our own image. Listen to this. They were already like unto God. They were not God, but they were very like God. And God saw that he had made them, and he said, this is very good. Satan deceives them that they might be like gods, and they lose 
the greater trace of godness which is already in them and receive the trace of small g, the gods of death. They lose the God of life and creation and power and they become, in that sense, Satan told them the truth in order to lie to them. They did become like gods, Moloch, the gods of of paganism. Now, when that happens, when, when we fall to the, to the lie of Satan in some way, then an immediate thing happens. That first thing was shame. The second is their relationship with God is instantly damaged. So God asks two questions. Two questions that he's never had to ask before. And it's not because he asked them out of ignorance. So first of all, let's clear that up. When God asks these questions, it's not because he doesn't know. It is in order to confront them. Where are you? He's never asked that before. Where are you? Because there was no separation, total intimacy. And Adam and God walked together and talked together in the cool of the evening. Total intimacy. Now, all of a sudden, they're hiding from God. Where are you? Well, we heard you were in the garden. And we were naked and we were afraid and ashamed. So then God says, who told you that you were naked? What he means is he's not really confused. It's not like God lacks the information. What he means is, who did you listen to? Who did you listen to? Why did you receive this? And then he says, what have you done? I don't know if you've ever felt deep, strong conviction since you got saved. So where you, where you sense that was wrong. Let me tell you, if you never have, let me tell you how it sounds. What have you done? Have you, you never heard that? I'm the only one in the whole, just the two preachers. We're the only two people. And you can hear that voice inside. It's the same voice. It's the, it's the question of the Garden of Eden. What have you done? It's laced with pain. It's not a question of ignorance. It's a message of grief. God grieved. Oh no. Look, you have no idea what you've done. It's not just eating the fruit. You don't know what you've done. You've unleashed hell. You have no clue what have you done. Um, imagine the, the teenage boy who comes home and he's got blood on his shirt and he rushes into his house and into his mother's arms weeping and he says, I've killed a boy with a knife. And she says, what have you done? What have you done? She doesn't just mean the murder. She doesn't just mean the the death. She means, what have you done with your life? What have you done with the rest of your life? What have you done to this family? What have you done to your body? What have you done to that family? You have no clue what you've unleashed. What have you done? God says, where are you? Who have you been listening to? And what have you done? In this, we now see the unfolding nature of the fall. Shameful separation from each other is the first time they've hid themselves from each other. Fearful loss of intimacy with God. Third, the misguided idea that they could hide from God. (laughs) Did they really think that some bushes and fig leaves were really going to hide from God? So that will show you how... I've always said this. I used to teach a lot of youth camps in my, you know, right at the end of the Civil War. And I used to always say to them, yes, sin will make you wicked, but first it makes you stupid. And, and there is a stupidity to sin to think that, that you can sew some fig leaves together and hide in the bushes and God can't see you. They're misguided. The fourth is, They are now cursed with sin and death. Even nature itself 
now enters in. The curse has entered the world. The book, the book of Genesis begins, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Whew. That's a, that's a sun splashed, dew sprinkled morning of unsearchable possibility. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The book of Genesis ends in a coffin in Egypt. The last sentence in a coffin in Egypt. The whole Old Testament begins. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God spoke light into existence and God saw that it was good. The last line of the Old Testament is the earth with a curse. The curse that infected the ground by Adam's sin after all of the law and the prophets and everything, it still remained at the end of the Old Testament. The curse was still there. It was the end of Eden. I, I think that we cannot grasp, maybe we can see some faint, you know, concept of it in our own lives at some level. I don't even know if I could give you an example, but I don't know that we can grasp what it means that Adam and Eve are exiled, expelled from the Garden of Eden. Never, ever to see it again. Remember what they've had. This shame-free, pain-free, there was, there's no Evil, there's no thought of evil, there's no concept. The beauty, the intimacy, the glory with each other and with God, and now it's over. They are exiled, and God places cherubim and a flaming sword that turns every way. In other words, indicating no matter which direction you come from, you'll never get back in here again. And they are stepping out into a world that they have no clue what they're going to face. They have no clue. Can we even begin to imagine the fear and the apprehension and the sense of loss and grief and for the first time, shame? Now, shame. Their heads are bowed. They, they, they leave and you, one can only imagine that they look back over their shoulders and those angels and that flaming sword stand there. Imagine the Horror of that moment. Sin separates us in a way that is like the exile from Eden. You step out into a world that is now cursed. What will it mean? What can be the result? Now, was there any hope? I just want you to hold that thought in your mind but we're going to go a little bit further into the depravity before we deal with the hope. They have now unleashed the, the sin and the curse and the death into, the, into humanity and into their own families. I want to deal with the corruption of rebellion. So let's take the story of Cain and Abel, which I know every one of you know that uh, Abel's sacrifice was accepted of the Lord. Cain's was not. Came, killed his brother. What what happened in that? The corruption of that family was was the result of spiritual envy. It was the it was the unleashing of something that Adam and Eve had never thought of. You have to understand this. They had never thought that of this capacity. They they now knew that they had the capacity to die, but murder was an entirely alien reality to them. Imagine the horror of the first murder. We live in a murderous country now. We, we live in a murderous country, hundreds and hundreds. People talk about these mass shootings where eight or ten people are killed and they're horrible, they're terrible, but there are more people than that killed every weekend in the major cities of America. We live in a bloodthirsty and murderous country. But can we even step back from that and imagine the horror of the very first murder? Sin corrupted the family. The brotherly love is gone 
and hatred takes his place. The brother becomes the enemy. Worship is gone. Worship begins to be the extension of his ego. The, the envy, the hatred, and the, and the egotism, the egocentricism of, of Cain. They are, they are the fertile seedbed of murder. Murder was almost the inevitable, the inevitable end of that. When he began to, to allow envy to come into him and hatred and, and worship, worship was no longer about God. Worship was about Cain. Secondly, there is the, the corruption of civilization itself. Turn, if you will, to chapter 6 and verse 5. This is a devastating passage of Scripture. And God saw the wickedness of man, humanity. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That, that's a stunning passage. Look at the repetition. Look at the layered things there. He doesn't say humanity was evil. Look at the words. It's layered. Do you see this? Look at it. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil. Not evil. Only evil. Continually. So civilization is now corrupted by sin. The, the wickedness of imagination. And then turn to chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Uh, we'll start with verse 8. And Cush begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. And he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. By the way, before the Lord, that is, uh, that's not saying for the Lord or in the Lord's glory or that he was working for the Lord. It means God could see the whole earth. God could see the whole earth and he could see what had become of Nimrod. And Nimrod became a mighty hunter, presumably a hunter of men. Nimrod is not a positive, not somebody to be admired. We're not talking about Jim Bowie here. He is, he is a mighty one, a hunter of men, one of the first military people. He begins to build an army. Even is Nimrod the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, Babylon, in the land of Shinar. So now you see the corruption of government. The government has been upon the shoulders of God. Nobody was electing officers in the Garden of Eden. Nobody needed rules. Nobody needed law. Nobody, nobody needed police. Nobody needed an army. There was no army. It was this perfect, unbroken, unblemished relationship with God. And now sin has infected the ground. Sin has infected the civilization. Sin has destroyed the family. The fundamental basic unit of creation is the family. God created the institution of marriage before he created the institution of, of the church. So the fundamental groundwork of God, humanity, its relationship, its love, its family, its civilization, and its government are all corrupt. Now we have the introduction of the first king. And they, they remember this imagination is evil. So let's, let's look at the story of the Tower of Bible for a minute, uh, which is from which we get Babylon. Um, there is actually the ruin of a, a massive ziggurat, a, a, a tower uh, near there. Um, it, 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 is, it was called the, the Temple of the Earth. So that pagan religion is building now, it is worshiping the creation of God. Now you have a king, you have an army, you have hunters of men, you have a, the violent, you have the Babylonian empires beginning to rise, and, and you have this, so don't, don't read this, this passage 
that God is looking down at the Tower of Babel and saying, oh, man, ooh, they're going to build up here. They're going to invade heaven. We've got to do something. We've got to do something. It is that God is saying, look at the, the, the power of their technology absent entirely anything of goodness or of me. There, there is no end to the evil that they can commit. There is a, a huge debate now in American culture, and I'm not, I'm not trying to enter into the debate. I want to deal with the vocabulary of the debate. And that is, what do we believe to be true about science? It's huge. This, uh, this pandemic, do you believe science or not? What's, that's, the, that's the debate. But just listen to Dr. Mark on one thing. Science is not a, in and of itself a moral commodity. Without, without a presiding ethos, science is, that is capable of great good that might create a medicine to heal us of something is capable of monstrous evil. The most advanced technocracy in the world at the end of the depression, of the worldwide depression in the 1930s, the most advanced technocracy in the world was Germany. And there was no presiding ethos. Remember the technology and the science. I'm going to say, just follow the science. I just believe in science. If science becomes your God, remember science has no inherent moral compass. Science is amoral. I'm not saying it's immoral. It's amoral. It has no morality to it. So therefore, if there's no ethos guiding it, the same technology that in, in Nazi Germany that understood nuclear fusion, that same technology created gas ovens that consumed six million people. The technology of Germany was so sophisticated that they figured out how to dispose of bodies in, in a genocide. So there's no, there's no ethos. So before you rush about saying, I, I'm just going to follow the science, what I would say is, as science is in the service of God, science is a blessing. When science moves out from under some kind of presiding ethic, faith in God, that's what happened at the Tower of Babel. There was no, there was no godness to it. It was a civilization that was building and consuming in its own technology. And the frustration and anger and downfall of it was the result. Adam and Eve introduced into us the, the seeds of the destruction of their own family, a murderous spirit, the corruption of civilization, the, the corruption of the human imagination. By the way, Oswald Chambers says, only after salvation and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the greatest gift of God to humanity is imagination. So when Satan was able to corrupt the imagination, he is corrupting the something inside of us that, that bears the image of a God who imagined the universe before he said, let there be light. God imagined everything that you see. It all existed in the imagination of God before he ever said, let there be light. So that imagination given to us as a gift, when that is corrupted and the imagination of their minds was evil continually, only evil all the time. What a corruption. So what do we say to all these things? But God, in the midst of all this, when Adam and Eve are exiled and they go out from the Garden of Eden, they are not wearing fig leaves. By the way, you will see classical art of Adam and Eve going out naked except for leaves. And um, that is not what the scripture says. The scripture says, and God made garments for them out of the skins of animals. So hinted at there in that moment is not only the providential care of God, but his willingness for blood sacrifice to care for them. They are covered 
by an animal that died for them to be covered. By the hand of God. But God. Cain took a stone and bashed his brother's brains in. And almost the next verse says, And the man knew the woman, and she gave birth and had a child, and his name was Seth. Seth is the, is the promise of God that we're, it's going forward. I haven't abandoned you. I'm still with you. I'm with the next generation, and I'm with the next generation. The corruption of civilization, imagination so evil, and yet, buried in the midst of that story, is this verse. And Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah and his ark became a a timeless symbol of the willingness of God amidst the oceanic horror of sin to save those who are willing to be saved. And then we go through all of this nightmare, sin and evil and flood and destruction and everything. And it says, and God called Abram. He begins again. God starts again. He says, I'm going to begin the story over again. The story that began in the Garden of Eden ended badly. Now he saves it with Noah. Now he begins again. Now he comes to Abram in Ur of the Chaldees. And he says, I'm going to start another story. And I'm going to start a story here that's going to lead to the instrument of your final redemption. From Abram to Jesus is a direct line. So in the midst of all of this, remember that God does not abandon us to our own devices, even though we may feel the horror of exclusion from Eden. We may look over our shoulders and say, what have I done? We may hear the, "What what have you done? What have you done? But even in the midst of all that, God says, I still love you. I'm still going to cover you. I'm still going to provide for you. I'm sending an ark. I'm sending a savior. He's still coming. So in the Garden of Eden, God, in the midst of the, of unleashing the curse, he says the seed of the woman will bruise the serpent's head. Seed, the seed of the woman. In the Garden of Eden, in the midst of humanity's most despicable sin, God himself prophesied the coming of the seed of the woman who is this same Jesus. We have waited on Jesus from the Garden of Eden. He is the seed of the woman. So I thought I'd close tonight with a fascinating story that happened to me. And I just want to share it with you. I was in the Kodaka airport coming out of Ghana many years ago. And uh, just sitting, waiting for my plane to go. And a young man came over to me. Of course, I... At that time, 1982, 1983, I was probably one of the only whites in the, in the airport. And the young man came over to me and he said, are, are you a priest? I said, well, let me ask you a question. Are you a Catholic? He said, oh, Father, I'm a, I'm a Catholic, but I haven't been in the church since my first communion. He said, are you a priest? I said, I'm all the priest you need. He said, well, I've been having a dream. And he said, I have dreamt it night after night. I've dreamt it for some years now, two or three years. And he said, it's driving me crazy. But he said, it's begun to occur to me lately. If I could tell the dream to a priest, it would be cleared up. He said, can I tell you my dream? I said, sure. He said, I dream that I'm walking through a garden. It's beautiful. The the the." The plants, the flowers are beautiful. But he said, then suddenly a a snake begins to chase me. And he said, I I know it's deadly. I know it'll kill me. And I begin to run and the snake is chasing me and chasing me. But he said, Father, the the snake only tries to strike my heel. He's he's not after my leg or my foot. He's trying to strike the heel of my foot. And I, I have the feeling in the dream, it's terrifying, that if he ever bites my heel, I'll die. And just when I I think it can't get any, that I can't escape, he said, I can't see who it is. But huge hands 
reach down and pick me up and put me in a chair in the sky. And then I see his foot stamp on the snake. I said, I said, are you kidding me? No, am I the only one? I thought he was having me on. I said, you do understand this is, this whole thing is in the Bible, right? He said, it is. He said, I've never read the Bible. I've never, never had a Bible. I don't need, he said, it's just a dream I've had. So I began telling him about the Garden of Eden. That the seed of the woman that, that the serpent would try to destroy the heel of man. The seed of the woman would come and bruise his head. And then I took him to the New Testament, to the book of Ephesians, that he would lift us up to sit together with him in heavenly places. He looked at me in that airport. It was, I'm telling you, it was out of the book of Acts. He said, what do I have to do? He prayed with me to receive Christ there in the Kodokai airport. He later became an elder at a church in Accra. We kept up together. He wrote me when he got married. His wife died. He wrote me about his wife's death and that he knew she was in heaven and that one day he would join her. All that because despite his ignorance and his sin and his backslidden religion, that God God reached in and took care of him. All of the discouragement of the first 10 or 12 chapters of of the book of Genesis. So you just read and you think, oh, God, this can't get any worse. And you turn the page. He said, well, yeah, it did. And you turn again. Oh, my God. You know, it's just horrible. But God. But God. God still covers us when we sin. God still cares for us. God still provides for us. And listen. Through Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that door which was closed to Edenic intimacy with God, Jesus has led the way back. Where I go now, you can come with me. And if I go there, don't you realize I'm going to prepare a place for you? So that that which we've been sealed out from, Jesus, Adam, the first Adam brought death. The second Adam brings life. The first Adam led us out of Eden. The second Adam leads us back in. The first Adam brought the curse. The second Adam bore the curse. Even from the Garden of Eden, the Bible points toward Jesus. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these precious folks. I thank you so much for the willingness of your Holy Spirit to illumine our hearts and minds. As we leave here tonight, God, may it be that we will say to one another, Surely the Lord has spoken to us. In Jesus' name, amen. You've been listening to The Leader's Notebook with Dr. Mark Rutland. You can follow Dr. Rutland on X at Dr. Mark Rutland or visit his website, drmarkrutland.com, where you can find information about his materials and his app. Join us next week for another episode of The Leader's Notebook.